webinar. My name is Chantel, and today we're going to discuss roofs. We're going to look at putting on a roof using a few different methods, and then how to edit and change the roof itself, and looking at all the various properties inside the roof. When the um, formal part of the presentation is over, we'll open up a chat panel, and that gives you the opportunity to go into the chat panel and type any questions you might have about roofs, so I can look at them and answer those questions live for you during the webcast. Following the entire presentation, I'll email you out a booklet so you can read about all of the different steps we took and practice them on your own computer. So let's get started. So for today's webinar, I'm going to be putting on a few different roofs. I'm going to be putting on a roof on the second story of the home that you see, and I'm going to be putting on a porch roof on the ground floor, and then we'll be changing up their style and editing them in a number of different ways. So to do that, I'm going to put this down into a 2D view. So in the 2D view, you can see down in the lower left-hand corner of my screen, we're on the second floor. So on the second floor, I'm going to put on a roof using our automated tools, using the, the roof by perimeter. The roof by perimeter automated tool will look at the exterior walls in your building. So right now it looks at the four walls that I've drawn and sees that as the perimeter of my building. So it's going to search those perimeter walls out when I choose a roof and put a roof to fit over top of those walls. So depending on the shape of your exterior walls, your roof using the roof by a perimeter tool will follow those perimeter walls and give your roof the exact same shape. So in the catalog panel to the right, I'm going to choose the 1012 hip roof with shingles, and then I move my cursor inside the building. It doesn't matter where my cursor is inside the building, as long as it's inside. So I always tell people, don't put your cursor close to a wall and think that you have to put it in a wall corner. Make sure you're right in the heart of the building so it knows to search out and find all of the exterior walls. If you pick close to one wall, it's not finding all of those other perimeter walls. You have to be right inside the building itself for it to find and source out those perimeter walls. And you can see what it's highlighted blue. It's found as the perimeter shape of my building. All I have to do is left click, and it takes that 1012 hip roof that I selected from the catalog and applies it to the perimeter shape of my building. From there, that gives me the basis to move on and make changes and edit the roof that I've put in. I always go through a series of steps every time I do a roof, and I go through the same steps every time. So the first one is I put the roof on. I've got it done by the roof by perimeter. The second step I always take is finding where I want to put gable ends. So looking at my plan, I want to make this side a gable and the opposite side a gable. So to do that, I left click on the overhang of the roof that I want to be a gable. When I left click on that overhang, we'll notice that arrows project from each individual surface that makes up the roof. So I have four separate surfaces to this roof, the four different hip ends. When I've selected that left overhang line, you'll notice that its arrow is green and all of the other arrows are red. The green arrow indicates that it's been selected and it's, been, it's ready to be changed. The red arrow is indicated that those sides are going to um, retain their current values. They're going to stay a 10, 12 hip roof unless I select them. If I move my cursor over to one of the other arrows, I simply have to left click on it to make sure that it's selected as well. So now I have two arrows selected. Will also happen to the other side of the, the house, the roof, because both of those arrows are green. The two remaining red arrows will stay as a 10, 12 hip. So with those two sides selected, I right click. And when I right click, it always reveals options for the thing that you have selected. So right now when I right click, I see all of the options that I have for the roof. What I want to do is to take these two sides and make them gables. So to do that, I have to visit the properties of the roof. So I'll click on properties. 
that takes me into this dialog box about roofs. Here it outlines all of the information about the roof that I inserted. So I can see at the very top that it's a 1012 hip roof with shingles. The roof shape I can see here is a hip. The parameters list out that it's a 10 and 12 slope. The overall thickness of the roof itself is six inches. It has a 16 inch overhang and it has a one foot five, almost a one foot six overhang drop. The diagram to the left of all the parameters will spell out all of these various different uh, parameters that we've listed out. So if some of the terminology looks a little different than what you would call it out as, you can see what we're referring to. Okay, so you have all of these different parameters and you can go in and change any one of them. So if I simply wanted to change these two sides to be six and 12 instead of 10 and 12, I would just change that slope value, click okay, and those two sides would become six and 12 and the front to backs would be 10. To change the shape of the roof, I click on this roof shape button that currently says hip. I left click on it. It brings up another dialog box that shows me all different styles of roofs. So I have a hip, a gable, a mansard, a Dutch hip, custom, bullnosed, arched, and double. By clicking on any of these shapes, it'll take the two sides that I've selected and change them to that new shape. When we look at something like custom, that will allow me to have multiple slopes up one side. So if I go from a 10-12 to a 2-12 back to a 6-12, if you have like a gambrel style roof, you can achieve that using the custom style. For the double style, um, it's quite handy for two different reasons. One, if you have a main roof that dies into a shed roof, maybe over a porch at a front door, going from maybe an 8-12 dying into a 4-12, double slope is perfect for that application. It's also great for kickouts. So if you put a gable end in and then the two sides um, that go into the gable kick out, maybe from a 10-12, again, maybe to a 4-12, the double slope is perfect for those as well. So for our example today, I'm simply going to change them to gable. When I change them to a gable, you'll notice that that parameters list shrinks dramatically. There's not a, a lot of options left. That's because the gable roof is gonna get its main information from the sides that feed into it. So if I move this out of the way here and grab my little pen, when I make um, this roof into a gable, it's just going to extend the overhang right to the end here. So that ridge comes all the way to the overhang. So I don't need slope. It's gonna get its slope from the two sides that feed into it. And that's from these arrows right here. So I no longer need slope. I do need my overhang because I have to have that value there to see what the overhang value is. But all of those other parameters, are not applicable to a gable end because it's simply dragging that ridge all the way to the end. So that's why the parameter list shortens. What you will see there as well is a new parameter called display gable. Display gable deals with the area underneath our gable end, that triangular area underneath the gable. It wants to know how you want to build the wall under the gable in that area. So right now it says display gable and it's set to none. None means that the wall that's existing, this one right out here in my model, is automatically going to extend up underneath that gable, balloon frame up, and deal with the gable end area. So if the walls that you have there under their properties are set to auto extend, they'll automatically extend up and fill in that gable end area. And I'll show you the properties of the wall to show you exactly what I mean. If you don't want to balloon frame the walls up and fill in that area with a balloon frame, then your next option here is to click on the word none and you'll see surface. You would use a surface if you were um, framing the roof with trusses and you had a gable end truss and you were just finishing off the gable end with a surface whether it be stucco or whether it be um, siding, whatever you're gonna leg to that gable end truss, you're just looking for a finish to put onto that gable end truss. The last option you see there is wall. 
So if you build a gable end wall, then you would use the wall option and it will put a wall on top of the existing wall and build it as a separate gable end wall in that area. So depending on your building practices, you would choose one of those three options. Currently, the model that I'm using has the existing walls auto extending, so they're gonna balloon frame up. So I'm gonna leave this at no, and then I'll show you the various options once we're done here. All I have to do now, since I've switched it to Gable, is click OK. And you can see as soon as I click OK, the ridge line extends itself all the way to the ends, and I have my gable. So if I just pop this into a quick 3D view, we can see the gable on top of the house now. I'm gonna put that back into 2D. For our plan, what we'd like to do is to put it into a, a Cape Cod type of style. And the back of the house isn't going to be a true two story where the front of the house is. So at the back of the house, I'm gonna click on the overhang line. I want to indicate to the roof that it's going to be sitting lower at the back end than it is at the front end. So at the front end of the house, it's sitting at eight feet, top of the second floor walls. At the back end, it's going to die down almost to the ground floor. So I select just this one side, make sure it's a green arrow and that all the other arrows are red. And then I right click and look at its properties. When I'm in the roof's dialog box, now I'm dealing with the height of the roof. So that's where I would now click on the Support and Details tab. Under the Support and Details tab, this is where we indicate the various heights that we're going to be supporting this roof. And you'll notice that we have two different support types, rafter and truss. We'll, we can set the two different options because in truss, we can then set a raised heel so that we can show the um, height of the truss sitting exactly where it would on the wall, or we can set it to rafter, and then we can fill in the information about bird's mouth and seat. So when we're putting in that rafter, we're putting in that cut, so it's again sitting on the wall correctly for us. But in either instance, we need to know this A value. What is the height of the wall? that is supporting this rafter. So at the back of our house, we're gonna be supporting it on just a one foot knee wall, one foot. And then all I have to do is click okay. By changing the plate height back here, that drives that ridge line forward. So if I look at this in a 3D view, we can see the front end of the house, the roof, is sitting at eight feet, and at the back end, you can see it, it dies down dramatically down to just that one foot plate height. So if I turn this, we can see the shape of the roof. So when we need a roof to die down to a, a lower height in a Cape Cod kind of style, we just change that support height. I'll put this back into 2D. Now that we have that ridge line moved up because the plate height at the back is lower, we can create dormers in this area as well. So I'm gonna go up to the Tools pull-down menu, and under Tools, I'm gonna to go to Layout, and I'm gonna choose Line. When we create dormers and insert them onto our roof, our main roof structure on the building, it's a, the dormer itself is gonna be attached to your cursor, and you just left-click to insert it. So I like to use Layout Lines, so that I can indicate exactly where I want them to sit. So I have an exact point where the support point of that dormer is going to go. Let me illustrate that to you. So I'm just gonna click on the line tool. And once I've clicked on the line tool, I'm gonna to put my cursor right in the middle of that back rear wall. And I just left click once to start drawing the line. And then I just move my cursor right up to the ridge line and left click again. Just gonna right click until I'm finished drawing that line. Now I'm gonna left click to select that line that I drew, and I'm gonna right click again, and this time choose Offset. So with the selected line, I right click and choose Offset, and Offset is making a copy of that line. So if I had 
four dormers off one side of the line and four on the other side, I could change this number to how many copies I want to make of this line. So I have a point where each one of those dormers is going to be inserted. I only want one, so I'll keep that number at one, but I do want it to be, um, sorry, nine feet away from my original line. And I click OK. So I'm now with my cursor going to indicate which side of this line I want to make a copy nine feet over. So I'll left click here on the left side of that line and another line appears. With this line still selected, I'm going to right click and do the exact same thing again. So I right click, choose offset, tell it the distance away from the original line is nine feet and I only want one copy, click OK and then left click on the right side of that line. Now I have three layout lines indicating where I want the dormers to exist at their peaks along those lines. I'm going to draw another layout line, tool, layout, line, to show how far back I want to set the dormers as well. So I'm going to put my original line in the corner here of this wall, left click, and pull it all the way over so it's outside of the building. I pull it way outside because eventually I'm going to want to erase it. So when it's way out here, it's going to be easier to pick than if it's sitting right there in the heart of my wall. So I left click way outside my building and then right click and tell it I'm finished. Again, I left click to select that newly drawn layout line. I'm going to right click and choose offset again. That original line I drew, that horizontal line, represents where the current support point is for the main roof. My support point I want for the dormers is going to be two feet back from that. So I type two feet and click OK. And then put my cursor on the roof side and left click. So where these lines intersect, here, here, and here, will be the insert point for my dormers. So my dormers will come in and come along here because they're going to be inserted on center line right like that. So their front walls are going to come right in just like that. So those lines that I drew are merely to indicate where I want the dormers so they go in exactly where I want them to go. Okay, so with those construction lines drawn, I'm just going to erase off the extra lines I drew. And here's the line. I then go up to the roof command and choose dormer roof. The dormer roof dialog box is going to open. It's got a lot of different options in there so I can personalize the look and the size of the dormer that I want to draw. So right now the dormer width says five feet. It's going to be five feet overall. That's this A value right here. The dormer roof is going to be a four and 12 hip roof with shingles. I'll just keep that same roof style, but that if I do click on that button, it just simply takes me back to my catalog to choose whatever roof style that I want. Underneath that, you indicate if you want the front to be a gable or not. So instead of having to put the roof on and then change the front to a gable by selecting the arrows that appeared like we did for the main roof, this option allows me to put it on as a gable right off, uh, right off the bat. I'm going to tell it I want to include walls. Sometimes you might not want to include walls if it's a full stormer, but I will include walls and I'll pick on the dormer wall here and put them in as two by four stucco. And this last option here, this B support height, is the height of the dormer walls. So where they come out of the roof until they're supported by the dormer roof, that's your B value. That's your support height above the main roof. So I'll keep that at three feet and click OK. A copy of the dormer attaches itself to my cursor. And all I have to do is move my cursor to where I've drawn those um, lines and just simply left click to install it. I'm going to right click and hit finish. And I'm going to go through that same process again because I want three different types of dormers to be inserted. So I'm going to click on the dormer tool again. Tell it I'll keep the five foot width, keep the 412 um, shingle roof, but I'm going to uncheck that I want it to be a gable front. And I'm going to put in the two by four stucco again. So the only real parameter that I changed is when this one's going to go in, it's not going to be a gable front. 
I click OK. And again, I move my cursor so I can line it up with the construction lines I drew. Left click. And I'm going to put the last one in with those same parameters. Left click again. And then I can right click and tell it I'm finished. Three dormers. And if I look out in my 3D view, I can see the, the dormers um, cutting through um, the roof here. So there's my three dormers, one gable, two hips. What I'm going to do now for the middle one is change it up a little bit. You might want a shed style dormer. To do that, you need to click on the overhang of the dormer. When you do that, you'll notice those same arrows appear, one for each side of the roof. The front surface, the two side surface, and the back end that's um, cutting into the main roof that's set as a gable. I'm going to select these two sides. Right now, we know the front and the two sides are set to hip ends. They're all three hips. The back end of a dormer is always a gable, so it's cutting back into the roof. When you have a dormer right adjacent to, uh, sorry, when you have a gable adjacent to another gable, it automatically makes it a shed roof, so gable to gable. So if I'm looking at, I'm just going to do a little bit of a drawing here. If I have a roof and I make this side a gable and this side a gable, we know we'll have the ridge running down the front. If I have a roof and I make this side a gable, this side a gable, and this side a gable, what I'll have is just a plane of the roof going up, so like a shed roof, because these three sides all want to um, force themselves up to a gable end that forces the three sides to be a gable. They get their plate height and their pitch from this fascia end right here, because it's going to hold the information about pitch and plate height. So when I want to create a gable, a shed um, dormer, I take the two sides and make them gable, knowing that this one already is a gable. I'll right click, erase all those drawings out of your way, and look at the properties of those two sides of the dormer, and simply make them a gable so you can see this happening. Then it becomes a shed. So if I look out in a 3D view, now we have a gable front, a shed and a hip front dormer. Okay, a question that I get quite a bit is well, what about putting windows into those gable end walls? When I click on the window tool, each one of those dormers has walls, so they'll accept a window. So if I just zoom in on them here, they'll all accept a window. Usually, what you have to worry about though is your head height of that window. Look at the very bottom of my screen where you'll see head height equals six foot eight. If you're putting dormers on top of a second floor roof and the roof itself went in at eight feet and the dormers are sitting even higher than that, it's that head height that has to change. And that's sometimes why you won't see the window going in because your head height's too low. For these windows, since they're part of that plate height of the main roof that's dying down to that one foot plate height, six foot eight is probably going to be too high because it's sitting up, these are only sitting three feet off of that roof um, itself, which is one foot above. So I'm going to take this down to about five foot eight and I'll show you the windows then. So I change this to five foot eight and I hit the tab key. That sets the head height. And then I can just place the windows along the back dormers here. And there they are. So if we look again in a 3D view, we'll see our windows going in. There's our windows nicely forming um, for those dormers. Okay, so I'll just try to uh, prop that up a little bit so we can uh, see that going through. Okay, so we have our three windows going in in our dormers, three different styles of dormers. I'm going to um, pop this into a 3D view by placing a camera inside our second floor. We have the 
walls themselves created and there's our little windows going into those dormer walls if I wanted to I could grab the material paintbrush to quickly finish off this roof it's showing the plywood the underside of the roof but if I just take a little swab of the pink color that's on the walls and then hit apply I can apply it to the roof itself so it looks like the the main roof coming into these dormers in this finished space so when we're looking at the dormers, there's a question as well as how can I get the dormers to not cut in here, but come straight down if I wanted them to finish off here right into the wall, onto the floor. Well, if I take this wall of this dormer and select it, you can see it's highlighted green, but you see that it ends itself off sitting here on the floor. You can see the green, blue, and red grip point of that wall. If I right click and look at the properties of this dormer wall, one of the options for it is to auto extend under the top and bottom tab. That means this wall is automatically going to extend itself to roof surfaces, the top and the bottom of it. So right now the bottom of that wall is being cut off by the roof. So if I just made this a level height of five foot one and seven eighths, and click OK or whatever height's going to be applicable for that dormer, you can see that it comes down. And now it knows to bring itself down to the floor, not be cut off by the roof. Auto extend extends it up to roof surfaces, bottom and top. So it was being cut by the roof itself. So if you want it to extend down to the floor, make sure that you have auto extend turned off. Okay, I'm gonna go back down into a 2D view. And now I'm going to slip down to our ground floor and discuss the, the roof over top of our uh, front porch area. We're gonna want to build a shed roof. So if I put this into a 3D view quickly here, what we're going to be building is a roof that's going to come down, die onto these columns, and then come right back up again and come along right in this area here. So this is going to be our roof area right in here, just a shed roof coming down and um, bracing itself on the columns that would have been drawn. So to do that, I'm gonna put this back into a 2D view. I'm gonna go back up to our roof tool. And this time I'm gonna choose roof by picking points. Same tool as the automatic tool, the um, roof by perimeter tool, and the fact that the roofs that are going to be inserted are going to function the same way. They both have a roof surface. They both can be edited. It's just the method that we use to put them in. The roof by perimeter tool allows us to put our cursor inside the home and it finds the perimeter. The roof by picking points wants us to draw out the perimeter shape of the roof. So in my catalog, I'm going to choose the 412 hip roof. And I'm going to, with my cursor, draw out the shape of the perimeter. So I'm gonna start on one of the columns right in the middle of it to say, this is my start point, left click. Come to my next corner, the last column, and to say, this is another corner, left click. Bring myself up to the supporting wall in the house, left click, and then bring myself down to my original uh, start point, the point on the support wall that's right perpendicular to my support support point that I started with and I left click. So I've indicated four corners of this roof. I don't go back to my original start point to finish it off. You can see that it's drawn that line itself. It's automatically drawing a polygon shape following around the points that you pick. So think about it would be um, just like if you had a board with nails in it and you took an elastic around it and wherever you're picking these points, you're dragging that elastic around those nails. So it's automatically going to take that elastic to the very first point. So once I've indicated those corners of my roof, I simply right click and tell it I'm finished. And it automatically puts in a 412 hip on those corners that I've drawn. So I've got that perimeter roof now matching the shape of the perimeter that I drew. So now I have to edit it to show it that I want the sides 
to slope up to the roof to create that shed. So I'm going to select the roof on the right hand overhang line. And when I do that, I see the arrows indicating each of the four different surfaces that makes up this 412 hip. I'm going to select these three sides. These three sides are going to make up the shed portion of this roof. They're the ones that are going to be just sloping up. The front edge that I'm leaving as red is the edge that determines pitch and plate height. So from that front edge, everything's basically just going to slope up to meet the house. So the sides and the back don't have slope value. They're just gables that slope up following the slope and plate height of this red arrow. I always like to think of it when I'm creating veranda roofs or shed roofs, um, that any side that where you would not hang a gutter will become a gable end. So that would mean any side up against the house or any gable end or any end that's a shed end um, would become our gable ends. So with those three sides selected, I right click and I look at their properties. And all I'm going to do is change them into gables and click OK. So because I have gable, adjacent to gable, adjacent to gable, it creates the shed going up. You can see how it returns back through the house. I'm going to select the roof. I'm going to select the back arrow, just the back arrow, because right now it has a similar property of the other three sides. It has the property of having a 16 inch overhang. So I'm going to reduce that back to zero so that it stops it at that support wall. So with just that one side selected, I right click and I look at its properties, and I change the overhang here to zero, and click OK. And that brings it right back up front again. That roof, even though we picked points, functions the same way as our roof on the second floor. I could put a dormer on it. I can, as you saw, change the sides to be gables, change their overhang values. That can all be played with and changed. I want to show you one further thing before I open up the chat panel um, to look at your questions. Over this front door, I'm going to um, create an extra little detail here. Instead of just being a shed roof, I want to build a little gable end area in here to highlight that front door and give it a little extra peek there. So I'm going to select the overhang line along the front edge. We only have one arrow. And right now that one arrow is telling me that it's a 412 hip. So if I change that as well to a gable, it's gonna gable up that whole end and it's actually just gonna put it into as a flat uh, portion because they're all gables. So I want to indicate to it, to the roof itself, that I want to come along as our um, 412 hip just to this point and then I wanna go into a gable and return back down and then go to our 412 hip again that I just want to create one little area in here that's a gable. To do that, I have to break the overhang line into pieces to show it that I want to go hip, gable, hip. So with this one side selected, I right click. And when I right click, you'll see the option to break. I'm gonna move my cursor on top of this one column and left click. Now I have two arrows. I'm going to do the exact same thing again to this um, overhang line on this other side. So this one here, now this one piece here, I'm going to break it at the column as well. So with that one arrow selected, I right click and again I choose break and I break it at this column. So now I have three arrows. That overhang line I broke into three separate sections. So what I do to one of those sections doesn't have to happen to the other two sides. All I want to change is that middle section. You'll notice at the bottom of the arrows, there's blue squares. Those blue squares are grip points. So even if I want to move the support point of this overhang line just at the middle section here, 
I can put my cursor over top of that blue square, that blue grip, and notice what happens to my cursor. It changes automatically into a move indicator. So if I hold down my left mouse button and don't let go, I can move it down. So all of a sudden I've changed the shape of the roof as well. So it's gonna come down and across. Now with just this one green arrow selected, I'm going to right click and look at its properties and change it into a gable and click OK. So I go from hip to gable to hip and I even notched it out a little bit. And when I notched it out a bit, you'll notice it created automatically for me two new red arrows for those two sides. So those two sides themselves can be any um, slope that I want them to be. The main roof is 412, but if these wanted to be 1012, because they're a separate arrow, they can be whatever slope I want them to be as well. So if we look at this in a perspective view, this is what we've just created. What I'd like to do now is answer any questions that you might have about the information that I um, went over today in the class, looking at putting on a roof using the automatic roof tool, roof by perimeter, the roof by picking points tool that we use to pick points around the um, perimeter shape of our roof, looking at our dormer roof command, and then editing the roof once it's inserted to change the properties, whether it be just the slope, whether it be the style of roof, changing it from a hip to a gable, or whether it be breaking the roof into sections so we can change each side. In the GoToMeeting chan um, chat panel on the side of your screen, it'll enable you to type in any question and they come directly to me. So never hesitate to ask a question. This is a perfect opportunity to see a live um, answer to your questions. So make sure you type out your questions there and I'll answer them for you right now live. So let's go to our chat panel and see if we have any questions. What is the head height relative to on the dormer walls? The head height, when we set it, is always relative to the location. So if I come here to the settings and building locations information, anytime I go to put in a window or a door, it always looks here at the head height information. And since those dormer walls existed on my second floor, it automatically looked at the head height that's here. Even though they're separate walls, they're not part of my second floor plan, I put them in separately with dormers, they still reside on the second floor, so they still follow all the rules set here about head height. So when I was putting them in, six foot eight seemed a little high because those walls were set down um, to be only one foot off of the floor, and my dormers were up only uh, three feet above that, so it was only four feet right at the support point but then I was coming back two feet. So I knew about five foot eight would probably be right. It was a good guess. Um, and I put that in at that, that wall. But head height is always relative to the location that they're on. And those dormers were on the second floor. Okay, and I'm just gonna hold this dialog box up. I can see that some of you um, were on a little bit of a screen delay there. So I'm just gonna hold the reference of this building locations and this head height information. Every location has a head height and this is where it was looking. Okay, next question. Why wasn't the roof surface finished with drywall? Well, when we look at a roof and the properties of a roof itself, they all have finishes to them. So if I look at our roof and just its general properties, um, that deals with the appearance. So the roof surface um, on the outside is going to look like shingle number seven. The fascias is going to look gray. The gable ends are going to get a siding if I left them to surface instead of um, none. They're soffit. And then you see underside. What I've done to the underside is given them the new uh, color of Revere Pewter. But originally, the default roof had the look of plywood. So if you wanted to get inside the roof and kind of get a, a, a view of inside um, the roof itself, if this wasn't 
a dormer situation, if this was just the actual roof, the underside would look like plywood. So that's why it originally looked like plywood. But it could be, as I showed you there, any material that you want it to be. Okay, that's the only two questions we have up there, um, but lots of attendees today. So if you're thinking about asking a question, please post it up there now, because if there isn't any other questions, we're gonna end off the webinar, let you get on with your busy days, um, and I'll send you off the document that covers all of the information that we went over in today's webinar. But if you do have a question, make sure you take the opportunity to ask so I can show you live during the webinar. So if you've ever wondered how to do something or if there was a procedure that I went over and maybe just a bit too quickly for you, I can go over it all over again and explain it to you. So uh, one further moment for any questions and then we'll end off the webinar. So changing the material to drywall, would that add it to the material list? No, and great question. So when I'm in here and just using the material paintbrush, that's just for appearance sake. If I wanted this roof to take on the quantity of drywall as well, I would have to add that drywall in as part of the material properties. So looking at the properties of the roof, and this of course is for those of you that have building essentials or construction suite, you would add in an assembly dealing with the surface and how many pieces of drywall that would be. So the initial roof doesn't have anything to do with drywall, but if you wanted it to have a drywall finish and have that material report, you have to add the drywall material um, to the assembly itself so it knows to count those materials. When we use the material paintbrush, it's just for appearance sakes only. Okay, so um, again, I'm thinking we're having a screen delay there. I'm just gonna go back into uh, properties, quantity, and this is where the assemblies of all of the different materials that go into the roof so normally our roof assemblies are shingles and OSB and the roofing components um, and soffit and fascia and nail material. If you wanted to add in drywall, you have to add in an assembly to account for that as well. When we're here under appearance um, and using the material paintbrush, that's just for finish. So it is for appearance sake only. Okay. Not about roofing, but how did you get two veneer materials on the walls? Oh, okay, yeah, great question. Let's go back outside and I'll show you that. So the walls here, um, we have stone and stucco. Um, those walls um, are in our catalog. So if I click on walls here and I go down our list of walls, you'll see that we've got two by four stucco with a stone base and two by six stucco with a stone base. Those are the walls that were used in this particular project. And if I look at them to edit their information, they get the stone base from the trim tab. So if I go to the exterior surface on trim and scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that there's a custom trim of 36 inches of stone base. So we've added a wall that's three feet high to the bottom of that wall to show it that it is uh, got a stone base on it. So you could um, select here any type of base. We've got masonry bases there. There's brick, there's stone, or right click and add a new style, uh, depending on the composition of the wall that, that you want to do and if it's uh, multiple materials like that. And you can see that we also put on a chair rail of um, a three and a half by a five and a half inch concrete sill at the top of that stone to give it that finished appearance. So that wall is in your catalog. So take a look at it edit it, go to the trim tab and the exterior surface and play with that and all the values there so that you understand how all of that comes together. Okay, that seems to be all of our questions again. Um, 
I'm going to keep it open for one further minute, just in case anyone else has a question that I might not have finished off with today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. There's a good number of you in here today. And I just want to make sure that we're answering all the questions that we have for everyone. So if you do have another question, don't hesitate to use this time that we have together to get them answered. If we end off the webinar and, oh, now you remember something you wanted to ask, never hesitate as well to contact our technical support center. Um, they're open from 8.30 to 5. And all of our clients on Pro Architect, Building Essentials and Construction Suite that are on the current version all have access to technical support. So you can call in or email them your models and they can help you out. Let me look one last time for questions before we end off the catalog. Oh, there's another one. How do you maintain an existing roof structure when adding an additional roof structure as an addition and not have the existing roof combined with the new? That's a good question. So if I'm working on a remodel project, and I'm just gonna slip out here to the second floor, and say on the remodel project, we're gonna be building out an addition on the front here. And I don't want the new roof to blend in with the existing roof. I want it to be a totally separate structure. I'm going to show you two different ways to handle that. One, um, if I select this roof, we can see it's a 1012 hip roof with shingles. So if I'm clicking roof by picking points to draw out my new roof, if I use the 1012 hip roof with shingles and just map out an area of my new build here, right click and hit finished, it'll automatically combine the two roofs together. It sees that they both have the same parent roof style. They both came from the 1012 hip roof from the catalog. If I edit undo that and now choose the 612 hip from the catalog and do the exact same thing, you'll notice they don't combine. Now I can do an overbuild on that roof if I wanted to. Because they don't come from the same parent, they'll never combine. They'll never be able to combine their surfaces. So if you wanted it to overbuild on another roof, just make sure the parent from the catalog is different from the main roof. If I edit undo that entirely, come back to the 1012 and combine them, but I do want to show the tie-in nicely, but I don't want to quantify the existing, just the new. What I could do is select the entire roof, right click and tell it to convert the roof to surfaces and tell it that it is a asphalt shingle roof surface. It maintains the shape of the roof. Everything still has its same values, but now everything is a separate roof surface. So that means these new parts, if I look at their properties, I could set them to quantify and include all of the different materials. And for the existing roof, these pieces back here, I could look at their properties and tell them not to be included in the quantities and to remove all of these assembled materials so that it wouldn't quantify. So depending why you want them to be separate roofs, there's two ways to handle it. If you wanna show it as an overbuild, make sure they come from different parents. If you wanna show them blending in together, um, then keep them as the same parent, but then convert them to surfaces so that they don't quantify together. Okay, that seems to be all of the questions that I have up there, and I hope that answered them for everyone and everybody understood everything. If not, um, please never hesitate to contact our Technical Support Center. They're there to help you. And I hope the guide that I'm emailing you out right now will also help you as well. I want to thank everyone for joining me during their busy schedules. And I hope you have a fabulous week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.